Hello everyone. Um, yes, I, my name is Steve Paul. I work at the National Oceanography Centre in Southampton. And I, I think I've got one of the best jobs in the world. Uh, I've spent much of the last 30 years either studying the oceans or being immersed in the oceans or swimming in the oceans or all kinds of stuff. I've you know, swum with penguins, which is kind of cold but amusing. I've seen icebergs, so I've, uh, all kinds of stuff. And there are, in uh, most forms of life, bad jobs, and there are good jobs. <laughs> I've never much fancied the one on the, uh, on the left, but uh, there was somebody had to do it somewhere. Um, the one on the other side, that's the kind of stuff that I do. Uh, this is uh, a device called a, a, a CTD rosette, conductivity temperature depth, where we're sending uh, a machine at the seabed to gather water samples so we can find out the chemical components of the, of the water. So diving, it started off in rather a cumbersome manner, but this chap on the, on the left, left bridge, did uh, he was very, very successful at uh, salvage with a, a kind of an oak barrel with his uh, son in a rowing boat above. Uh, he was able to salvage uh, you know, gold bars, I suppose, in that picture. Uh, the, uh, the only air in there was the air that was inside the barrel when he got bolted into it. And I suppose when he started running out of air, he'd have to pull on a rope and hope somebody would uh, haul him in again. And the technology was slow to evolve, but uh, Gradually, you've probably all seen movies where somebody's wearing the sort of hard hat uh, diving, diving gear. It's still used uh, in, in some industries, particularly uh, you know, in uh, some forms of heavy engineering. But uh, things are moving on very, very fast. And uh, scuba diving, of course, um, particularly good for the sort of shallow water at work or marine archaeology, uh, recreational diving. All sorts of things you can get up to in there. I don't recommend you dress your dog up like that, but uh, you never know, you might get an adventurous hound. But if you want to start getting into seriously deep waters, you start having to uh, adopt some pretty impressive technology. Uh, I'm not too sure about the haircut of the guy in the top right. It's definitely a 1980s photo. But when you move down into the last couple of years, you'll see the, the, the one atmosphere diving suit, that's the US Navy one, which will be uh, used for sort of salvage or perhaps a submarine that's been lost on the seabed and you're trying to find a way to get to the crew and rescue the crew. And there are great limitations of what a human can do. Uh, you saw on Ralph's presentation earlier the image from Virgin Oceanic trying to dive down into the Challenger Deep. Well, uh, that vehicle, um, the, this is its predecessor, Deep Flight One. Those of you that watch uh, Star Trek Enterprise might see a, a short clip of this uh, flying under the uh, ocean in the, in the opening sequence. Built by a guy called Graham Hawks, who made many of the submersibles used in the Bond movies. And they have a ceramic hull, so very, very tough. There's no ballast tank. Uh, they rely on their wings to give them their uh, the downforce to keep them under the water. And you can do loops and rolls, and, uh, uh, amazing machines, but again, limitations of a human occupant. You need to have an air supply, and, uh, and of course, if you lose it, you lose a, a crew member. So increasingly, we've been looking at ways of taking a human out of the loop and let a robot, let a machine do the deep exploration for you. And perhaps one of the first examples of this was back in the 60s when um, the Cold War was in full, full flow. The, the rival superpowers, the USSR and the USA, uh, threatening one another with instant nuclear annihilation. And one of the ways they guaranteed this, this policy of mutually assured destruction was to have B-52 bombers, uh, that's, that's one they constantly in the air carrying a a uh, very heavy well, war load of uh, H-bombs, uh, very large yield hydrogen bombs designed to take out entire cities. These weren't precision weapons, they were designed to you know, drop one on the city and got rid of the whole thing. And these things were pretty much in the air all the time, and to stay airborne uh, they'd be refueled from a tanker. And in this particular instance, the B-52 managed to collide with its air refueling tanker off the Spanish coast. 
It was carrying four H bombs, but all with light and warheads. And three were recovered on the land, where the, uh, the, the aircraft went down. One was missing at sea. Now, you saw a photograph earlier of uh, Alvin with its nice red uh, Colin Tower and all the rest of it, as she looks today. But Alvin, as originally built back in the 60s, uh, it was you know, looked uh, even more sort of, you know, perhaps chipmunk like or something. But it's, uh, Alvin was sent out to try and find the, find the bomb uh, on the, uh, the Mediterranean. It took quite a long time to find it. And when it was time to retrieve the bomb, bearing in mind it was a multi megaton warhead. The rather sensible decision was taken, maybe we need to use a robot to actually do the retrieval. So, in came this vehicle, which was called uh, Curve, the Cable Control Underwater uh, Recovery Vehicle. And not a true robot in that it still had a human operator, but the operator was on the surface in a cab. And Curve was uh, able to go down, grab the bomb. In fact, the way they recovered it, because the, its claws weren't strong enough to be able to pull the bomb all the way to the surface. It, um, the operator put the propellers in the full reverse sort of thrust and it sucked the parachute the bomb was attached to into its propellers and thereby capturing it to raise it back to the surface. And there is the, uh, there is the bomb on the uh, recovery vehicle with a lot of very relieved looking uh, people around it. And if you happen to find yourselves in Albuquerque, New Mexico, uh, the casing of the bomb without its uh, multi-megaton warhead uh, is there preserved for you to, to pat on the head as you, as you wander past. And um, if, if you want to read more about this, there's lots of fascinating material about all the problems they had you know, trying to find the bomb and uh, how, to, how they decontaminated the land in Spain where the other three had landed. Uh, at least one of them only had one of its safety locks left intact when they uh, recovered it, so there could have been quite a massive explosion. So, Curve has gone on to various other generations of increasing sophistication, used for a number of different tasks. And the whole scene of these uh, remote operated vehicles, ROVs, has become gradually more and more sophisticated. So that an operator on the on the surface in the parent ship can you know, operate these things from a distance and go to depths far beyond what a human crew member can achieve. And if you like video games, it's probably one of the best jobs in the world. You sort of sit there in a controlled cab with the joystick, flying the ROV around, trying to find your uh, your target, or trying to do some scientific investigation. Or in the, the world of industry, you might be down there at the base of, you know, around those Christmas trees and around the risers, attaching things, repairing things, doing the kind of things that human have done in the past. Those aren't true robots, they still rely on a human operator. So we start moving into the vehicles that don't have a human operator and things that operate completely by themselves. Uh, this is one of the simplest kinds, the subsea glider. And these things are increasingly being used to undertake long oceanographic missions where you're trying to obtain multiple measurements over a period of weeks or months. Um, they, they literally glide on the density gradients in the ocean. And as you've seen earlier, one of them has already completed a, a complete transatlantic crossing. Uh, there are plans to perhaps deploy some of these things one day in a round the world race with a sort of rival teams to see if anybody can uh, get there get their gliders to do a complete circumnavigation. And there are quite a few different designs out there now as well. Uh, we use these ones, uh, the slope of gliders, and another one by a company called iRobot. And uh, we're, we're getting quite a lot of success now. But another layer of sophistication again is a program I was involved with for about four years. Uh, this one's called AutoSub. And it's a, it's a seven meter long true robot. Uh, it's completely autonomous. Once we put it into the ocean, it's by itself. It, it doesn't communicate with the surface at all, other than to tell us where it is occasionally. Uh, so it's given a pre-programmed course. Uh, in the case of this particular one, it has a range of about a thousand kilometers or, or eight days endurance. It was powered, believe it or not, by torch batteries, uh, the first one. at 3,600 D cells. So it really should have painted it gold and black or 
had a pink fur or something and had it advertised. Uh, all of a sudden did some fantastic work for us uh, out in places where it was hard for the research ships to go. And these machines are becoming increasingly sophisticated and available to different sizes. I mean, this gives the, an idea of the inside of a, of a Remus uh, autonomous underwater vessel <coughs> or the robots. So you see it has, uh, you know, has GPS systems for when it's on the surface. Iridium is a low Earth orbit uh, satellite system for communicating back to shore. Essentially, these things send text messages whenever they come onto the surface to tell us where they are and is it okay for them to go back down again. Uh, so you can operate them from the pub, which we have done before now, which is uh, a very civilized way of working. Um, and as, as, as I said, they come in all shapes and sizes. So you get the small ones like Remus vehicles, which you can literally carry in your own arms and send off to do some work. Um, the one here, uh, this was a very large Canadian uh, vehicle that was built for laying uh, telephone cable. Uh, it, uh, the, the hull was full of a large spool of fiber optic cable. Uh, they wanted to lay a, lay a telephone line along the coastline under the ice. It would be very expensive to do with an icebreaker. So they were able to load it all on board this little uh, vehicle, which traveled around the north coast of Canada laying the cable as it went, and then it was retrieved from a hole in the ice when it got to its destination. <coughs> and not all of the vehicles go under, under water. There are these kinds uh, as well, which are solar powered, so they, you know, they're not limited by their battery life. And they can travel around the ocean for you know, months at a time, gathering data and transmitting it back to base. So in the auto sub program, we focus very much on under ice work so that we could basically take the ship out to the ice edge, put the auto sub in the water, and then the ship could go and do something else while the robot went and did some exploration for us. Um, in this particular case, you, you notice there, it's carrying a, it's got a little weight under the nose. And that was a, that was a clever idea somebody on the ship came up with. We found that, you all know with an iceberg, you only see a small part of it floating above the surface, about nine tenths of it is, is submerged. And we found that uh, you, know, you, you, get to the edge of, you get to the edge of your ice. You put in the auto sub in the water about here, but you wanted to clear the underneath of that, that iceberg. And it couldn't dive deeply enough not to bump into the things as it was going around. So we hung a, a weight underneath the, uh, on the nose. And the, the strip of metal holding the weight on is made of magnesium. And the magnesium fizzes quite rapidly in, in, in salt water. So what we found was we could put the weight on, it would help pull the nose down so it would dive deeply. The seawater started fizzing away the magnesium quite quickly so that eventually it, it got thin enough that the weight dropped off and then it would level out, by which time it got to the point it could clear the underside of the, uh, the iceberg. So that was just a nice example of people thinking sort of on the hoof of a, a quick technical fix of how to uh, how to get Autosub not to crash into things. I would add that Autosub 2, and in fact that's a picture of Autosub 2 on the surface. I like this one, this is where the, the ship is um, obviously next to it, where the photographs were taken from. And as the ship has uh, moved near the Autosub, the, uh, the ice on the surface has been pushed sideways. And you can see all the little grooves left behind by the, uh, the aerials sticking out the top of the, top of the Autosub. So uh, this particular one, uh, we've, we've temporarily lost. Uh, I wouldn't say permanently lost, because we know exactly where it is. It's uh, 17 kilometers under the edge of the, uh, the ice sheet, under about 200 meters of ice. And uh, with the current wave of global warming and glacier melt, we confidently expect to get it back in about 20 or 30 years time. And it's got my secretary telephone number written on top of it, so she's still working for us, uh, you know, come those days, there'll be a, a little phone call coming in from somebody saying we found your missing, your missing robotic vehicle. But uh, we don't lose that many, unfortunately, but uh, they're, they're not cheap. So this is the, the program we, we've now moved on to, which is the auto sub long range vehicle. So 6,000 kilometers range, able to dive to 6,000 meters or spend six months away. And, and it does this uh, by moving very, very slowly, uh, extremely slowly. Uh, at one point, we even tried it with a single-bladed propeller to try and get the, uh, uh, the energy consumption down to the absolute 
minimum. So basically, move slowly, uh, uses uh, mobile phone technology, which is quite low energy consumption, and it goes to sleep when it's not doing anything interesting. So we'll just go and find someone on the seabed to just sit and have a snooze and then wake up and go and do a little bit more research. And we're hoping to use this vehicle to be able to do, to go to the places where the gliders can't go, you know, just by being pulled in by the ocean currents. And we're by no means the only lab working on these things. So, you know, there's an artist's impression of uh, two other types, the Puma and the Jaguar, who needs to go down to do uh, exploration in different parts of the global ocean. But all of this uh, leads to some quite exciting possibilities. And the one I'll finish off on is this one, which we're getting quite excited about. Uh, if you go out in the evenings at the moment, especially if you have a nice clear sky, there's a particularly bright, what looks like a star in the sky above you at the moment, and that's Jupiter, you know, the largest of the planets in our particular solar system. And if you've got a pair of binoculars, even quite a modest pair of binoculars, and you prop yourself up against a wall to keep your arms nice and steady, if you look at Jupiter through the binoculars, you'll see four pinpoints of light. And those are the four Galilean moons. It's uh, Europa, Ganymede, uh, Callisto, and Maya. And one of those moons, Europa, as far as we can tell, has an ocean on it. It's under a thick layer of ice, but nonetheless, there's plenty of water there. And on Earth, whenever there's been water, there's been life. And when space probes are taking pictures of the surface of Europa, it's got all this rather interesting orange coloration on the ice, which could be bacterial life. You know, it could just be various forms of uh, chemical process. We're not entirely sure. And we would very, very much like to go to Europa one day. So I'll leave you with this thought because this will tie in quite nicely with your sort of, you know, the time scale of your careers. Uh, we've already got the technologies that we've developed on Earth's ocean to be able to get down without uh, a human having to be in the vehicle and these things to go off and navigate and explore all by themselves. And the, there are quite a lot of ways that we can think of already, and I'm sure you guys might think of even better ones, to be able to send one of these robot explorers one day and have a look underneath the, uh, the ice caps on another world, and who knows what, uh, what might crop up there. So hopefully I'll see this in my lifetime, but if not in my lifetime, then hopefully in yours. So that's where I shall finish. Um,